Welcome to the Startup Grind. Hello, everybody. Um, we are from Startup Grind, uh, Sofia. Startup Grind is an international community uh, focused on um, uh, connecting entrepreneurs uh, to uh, uh, help them out, uh, um, find friends, um, uh, share experience, knowledge, and uh, uh, motivation and ideas. Uh, today we have for our guest uh, Vasil from Terenric. Welcome. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, we would like uh, to know more about uh, your uh, um, business experience. Uh, how uh, how did you start uh, your business? Uh, what's your background? And uh, how did you come up with the idea for Terenric? Okay, sure. Well, a little bit of a background on me. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of uh, Teleric, uh, a company pretty well known here in Bulgaria and amongst uh, developers because of the nature of the products that we built. Uh, our company is one of the premier uh, providers of uh, tools for professional developers. And uh, it was quite a journey to build it uh, from uh, a small startup which we started in 2002 back when there was uh, no financing, no angel investors, pretty much no uh, acceleration seed funds to uh, a global uh, business of 750 people across the globe that um, was acquired by Progress Software, a US uh, NASDAQ listed uh, company. And today I serve as the Chief Innovation Officer of uh, Progress Software and uh, drive our efforts around uh, digital transformation and really helping companies uh, survive in this uh, digital age, increase their digital IQ and be more successful when it comes to optimizing the customer experience, de internally and really uh, being uh, capable players in an increasingly digital uh, world. In terms of background, I wasn't supposed to be in, in technology. I had very different career plans. I've shared the story with uh, uh, folks on different events. Uh, I studied um, economics and business administration at uh, the American University in Bulgaria and I was uh, planning a career as a banker, investment banker. I uh, was planning to happily go into uh, an accounting or advisory company after I graduate but as luck would have it I ended up in, in technology and I don't regret it. <laughs> So it's, uh, it's been a great uh, journey despite that uh, the uh, destination was, uh, was different and it, it's always a, a pleasure for me to be able to um, share some of that experience with, uh, with folks like you at events that focus on entrepreneurship. You are four founders of Telerik, right? Can you tell us more about uh, the others and how, how did you came up with the mm -hmm. idea and um, how, how did you start exactly? Uh... Yeah, so uh, I knew uh, two of the other founders from a university who were in the same class and the fourth founder I knew from a previous uh, job where we became friends. So, and, um, Life took us different ways after university, uh, but we got together in uh, a UK company that was doing um, software for the HR industry. Uh, Boyko, one of the other founders, was uh, running the local office uh, here. I joined as a project manager, Christo joined as a developer, and Zarko joined uh, to, to help out with, with marketing. And uh, more or less um, things didn't work out exactly to our expectations uh, and we thought it's, it, it was time to, to part ways. Didn't mm -hmm. have much of, a, of an idea what we're gonna do, but we were young, we were careless, didn't have a family, so we said let's, let's try it out. Even though our parents strongly advised us against that. They, they didn't have the entrepreneurial spirit in them. 
but uh, we said let's let's give it a try and see what happens. And uh, our original idea was very very creative to be yet another outsourcing company because that's the only thing we had seen in terms of what was the path of a technology company uh, in Bulgaria back then. But we quickly found out that we are lacking some things. One was projects that we like inherited from a, a previous uh, job. That's how many companies was, were started. People left with the customer projects. It was not the case uh, with us. We didn't have much of a network because we were young, didn't have too much professional experience. So there was no easy way to find work and we're completely unknown on the international market. So with all the biz dev and hustling, it was pretty hard to to, to survive. And uh, in addition to that, we just didn't feel confident that we can really build uh, something that relies on like, a lot of manpower, at least back then. And we decided to try and productize something that uh, Christo, the only technical co-founder, as, as we like to joke, we had built an inverted pyramid. Three people on top, providing <laughs> management oversight and one person to, to do the job. <laughs> pretty, pretty creative for a technology company. Uh, but he, uh, he uh, had built uh, several user interface components as part of a research project that, that uh, he was doing uh, around the then uh, nascent uh, .NET uh, framework, the Microsoft .NET framework, and we saw that other people were selling that successfully, so we said, why, why don't we try to do the same, absolutely the same. Again, pretty much same pricing, same licensing, similar product, uh, and Christo gave us an ultimatum, you gotta sell something in the next few weeks or else I'm going back home to my parents. And that, that's, where, that, that's, where, that's where fate played a role and we got our first customer. Um, forever grateful to that person because it was the, really the, the spark that, that we needed. Um, and then came a second customer, a third customer. Uh, and we really faced one of the most um, serious decisions. What do we do about the consulting work? Because the consulting work started coming. Small projects, but growing in number, growing in size. And we were at this fork where we had to make a, a choice. Are we going to be a services company, a product company, or something in between that's destined to fail because we're too small and too unfocused? And even though we were making close to zero dollars, we said, okay, we're going to be a product company and we're going to keep that uh, focus. So, user interface uh, component, one after the other, technology after technology, the company grew in size, um, entered new markets, went beyond user interface technology, went beyond the Microsoft ecosystem, started doing other uh, tooling around developers, moved into um, other uh, areas, started building platforms, thinking about mobility come to today when all of, that, um, all of those assets uh, as part of progress are really driving a much bigger strategy. Mm -hmm. As a kid, how did you um, get your first customers? What Online. Was... So, <laughs> We didn't have the benefit of uh, having the people to do business development, uh, pe people to approach. So what what we did was put it up on the website, wrap it up as a zip file with all the DOLs and documentation and whatnot, sign up for uh, a payment processor so that we can take orders and see what happens. And it was it was very very fun because we uh, we started participating in all kinds of uh, community boards and really doing social marketing before it was popular before it had a name doing uh, what later became 
one of uh, investment bankers uh, favorite models volume and velocity low touch all those funky words we, we invented it we were one of the companies that invented it out of necessity so it wasn't really by a lot of smarts it was just something that you as a, a cash thrived uh, company which is uh, operating from Bulgaria but where customers are not in Bulgaria was the only means to, to get to customers. So it was a very impersonal model. person comes in, the website, reviews what we have to say, downloads a trial, tests it, if they like they buy. Very automated. And even though throughout the years our sales model got more complicated, we started adding inside sales, we started adding uh, field sales, uh, the, the bulk of it, the, really the core of our business model was the frictionless, low-touch, online-based model. Mm -hmm. And after which, uh, let's say, when did you start earning money? Like, uh, having a profit? It started, it's, well, depends. We weren't terribly uh, careful with accounting, so if, if we take our, our salaries out, then we were profitable very quickly, but uh, we didn't account for that. We, what mattered for us that, what, six, seven, eight months down the road, we were able to save enough to start generating enough to be able to hire our first person and then to start growing the, the, the team. And that for us was really the most important thing. And the company <coughs> has always been um, profitable uh, other, uh, outside of one year, I think it was 2011 or something like that. What was the first hire? The first hire was a friend from university, a software engineer. Yeah. Well, with that, with that strong management, we also needed uh, <laughs> technology people to build product. And what was uh, your role in, in the beginning? What were you doing exactly? So, in the beginning, you, you know, like any other startup, you throw everything you have at the world and see what happens. Uh, but, uh, quickly, we found out that we needed to uh, break up. Uh, the work in different domains. So I took on the sales, biz dev, uh, operational side of things. Uh, Spetuzar took the marketing, finance, uh, design side of things. Boyko helped out with some of the design but uh, took on the uh, IT stuff so that we can operate uh, normally. And back then, believe it or not, it was not that easy to operate normally because Internet was horrible, first few months were on dial-up, then we tried with uh, Wi-Fi access, but the problem was that our office was uh, close to the office of the intelligence agency, so the Wi-Fi <laughs> signal got blocked and for three weeks we didn't have internet. So in terms of uh, infrastructure challenges, it was not like today. Everything's in the cloud, you have uh, 100 uh, gigatera trillion bits of the internet at home, uh, then it was it was uh, challenging. So Boyko really ensured that, that we can operate normally. And Christo took on all the product development work. So what other challenges you had in the beginning? Other than infrastructure challenges, not having money, <laughs> not knowing what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> We had a mission, we had a vision. <laughs> as much as I'd like to say we had a vision, we had like close to none. But we, we, we more or less believed in execution more than, than grand visions. And luckily it bought us some time until we started creating those beautiful PowerPoints with big visions that nobody understands <laughs> and people revolt against them. And, uh... Tell me more, more about the international business, how um, uh, can you uh, compare business in Bulgaria and business uh, outside of Bulgaria, what are the challenges, are they the same or different? They're, they're very different, uh, but you know, our, our business model was such that we, most of our customers from pretty much day one were international, so 60-ish percent of our uh, 
uh, revenues were coming from North America, 30-ish from Europe, and that's Europe from Austria to the north. And uh, everything else was was rest of the world. So by virtue of our model and where our buyers were, we were an international business from, from the very onset. Uh, but it took us a number of years to start uh, opening up international operations to really grow a different type of uh, sales organization where you didn't serve everything through the website but you essentially had people to do community, to do inside sales and really have a local uh, local presence. Uh, even though that, that, that was not directly contributing to the uh, to, to the business impact but it was more uh, contributing to, to the brand at least in first and, and to you being able to service your customers better in those geographies because the time offset is always a problem when your customers are in the states and, they, and you have a seven to ten hour difference with them you always have like a one day offset between when they submit the ticket and when you answer it so that's why we over time we needed to develop more local presence so that we can embed ourselves into local communities and we can stay close to customers <coughs> and learn more about them uh, in terms of doing business, it's, it's different and every, every, even Europe, there, there's no such thing in Europe, you do business very differently in every country, pretty much across Europe. Doing business in the Nordics, in France, in, in Germany, in Italy has its specifics, what's acceptable, what's not, how, peop how serious people are about uh, something, clarity of communication, transparency on, on business terms so and you, just, you adjust you just embrace the fact that it's it's different and you can't have like uh, a cookie cutter approach for every market and that's what people on the ground give you the perspective of what works in a given market and what doesn't so you can adjust your, your strategy whether it's pricing whether it's communication whether it's should you localize or should you not your product but it's expensive it's much easier to just have a website where people come in, look at it, try by. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us more about um, when the company was uh, bought and how, how this, this, this happened? Uh, were you actually looking for um, businessmen to buy it? or? Uh, well, as a CEO, you have you have a responsibility to your shareholders to, to always look for the best option for, for the company. And that's one of the hard. Uh, that was one of the things that were pretty hard for me to learn the distinction between founder, shareholder, and CEO of of, of, of the company because they they give you different things, but they also require different. Things. And you need as a CEO to make the separation between you as the founder and one of the shareholders with what's your responsibility to your employees, to your investors, to your customers and not really you as the co-founder, the emotionally vested person in, 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 in the business. So we were always on, on the lookout and you know when, when you attract uh, growth capital when we had an investment from Summit Partners, you know that the clock is ticking. So once you start working with a professional large VC company, you know that you have a given amount of years to build the company by this much. And then if you do a good job, you have more or less three paths. One is go public if you're big enough, go private strategic investor buys you or raise more capital to fuel more growth until you get bought or you sell the company or uh, you, you go public so that, that's more or less uh, you don't want to think about the option of going bust because it's not good for anyone so we were, we were on we had different aspirations and people know that we we wanted to become a, a public company we deeply believe we have everything that is is needed 
but uh, when we received a few inbound offers, we started considering the other, the other option as well. Um, first, because as a CEO, uh, you have a fiduciary responsibility. I dismissed the first uh, offer, but then I remembered that I have to bring it to the board, even if I don't believe that it's very interesting or relevant. And as we started thinking about that, discussing it more with Svetozar and the other guys, we, we, we came to a conclusion that perhaps this is the, the best thing that uh, we, we could do to partner with uh, Progress Software, the, the company which we proudly work for uh, today, because there was a great uh, strategic fit, product portfolio fit, not much overlap in terms of technology, not much overlap in terms of strengths of the of the companies. Um, we wouldn't be absorbed by a really big company where we'd be completely marginalized. We'd be able to have an impact and for us it was very important that we have an impact, that uh, Bulgaria remains intact, that it's an important uh, part of uh, the future organization, that everything else that we've built around the globe would preserve as much as we can and that we have an opportunity to, to learn and, and, and grow. Uh, and as much as uh, each of us was emotionally like vested in the business and we had different ideas, we just thought it's the best thing for, for employees. And you know, if, if you not try to build a public company, you really don't know what what that entails. The level of stress, the expectations, the things you have to do, uh, the, the way in which you have to grow. My, my job changed so many times in the last uh, few years as the company grew and that was supposed to continue and continue. I spent uh, five months out of 2013 away from my family and kids. So it, it, it's a really hard toll and at some point you start asking yourself, okay, is this the best thing for me, for my family, for all the people around me, uh, for, an, for a young organization that if you push it too hard it can, it can implode. And all of us are uh, people who are relatively young, um, most of the people in the company are much younger than, than I am, so it, it was a good opportunity for everyone to become of a bigger, more professional organization, but to continue executing on a nice vision, get that vision to be even bigger, bolder, and learn and grow. So I, I personally don't regret it uh, at, at all. If, if somebody is that motivated to build uh, big companies, mm -hmm. there's plenty of opportunities. Each of us has a lot of uh, professional life, hopefully, ahead of them. Um, what uh, have changed after the life? In terms of... Uh, I, I managed to stop doing a lot of things that I didn't particularly enjoy doing, which was... Uh, managing the board of directors, uh, running all aspects of the company. I've always liked the most working on products, driving product strategy, building uh, teams, building success around uh, some, some new initiative. So today I, I have uh, the perfect opportunity to do that and not do many of the other that I didn't find particularly uh, rewarding. Just the, the general management side of things. Um, are there uh, new challenges after the buy for the company? Or it's going smoothly? And, uh... there, there are a lot of uh, challenges and that, that, that's normal. If, if you don't have any challenges in life, that, that shows a, a problem. Either you are uh, expectations for yourself are pretty low or a big wave is coming and you just are not ready for it. Many things changed and they changed for, for the better in my, in my view. You learn how, to, how a big company operates, what drives it, you start understanding many things that back then you would criticize and they don't make sense but 
you really see that world and why it's the way it is and how it all makes sense and how you can make some of some parts of it uh, better. So it's it's a constant process of uh, of learning and humility, if you will. Um, there are quite a few times when I, because I'm pushing myself, my team. To, to new boundaries where I felt incompetent in, in what I'm doing. Uh, you feel this sense of helplessness, but then quickly you, you pass that threshold and you build it into uh, knowledge, you share that, you feel a lot of uh, excitement from, from doing that. And um, it, it was also a great, uh, it's a great experience to step down from the helm of the organization into a more operational role few uh, levels down because then you see the world that you weren't particularly seeing. When people would come to you, you would dismiss them, ah, oh, you know, whiner, you don't understand that. And, you know, my advice, be like the water, find the cracks, yada, yada, you know, it's so easy when, when you're not the person on the other side. And now when I have to battle some, uh, with some of those things, you see how people had a point, you see where things went wrong, that it was not the people, it was process, it was systems, it was goal setting, it was a lot of other things that contributed and it was not people's uh, commitment to the company or their desire to improve, uh, to improve things. So having those two angles really helps in, in understanding and when you understand you can change something for, for the better and you're not so judgmental as you were before. Humility is a big, big thing. Because if you're humble, as much as you can be, of course, you, you, you're you listening to what the world is telling you and you can react. Otherwise, you can't really make much of a change. Can you tell us more about uh, Silicon Valley and uh, how the company get to, get to Silicon Valley? Oh boy. <laughs> the, the only thing I regret is that we didn't do anything about setting up an operation in, in the valley up until 2013. And it was, it was very accidental, even that. The way all of it happened, the way it happened was our investors uh, called us and said, hey guys, why don't we do the next board meeting in uh, Palo Alto? We don't feel like going to Palo Alto. We just came back from a trip in Asia. We visited <laughs> India, uh, Sydney, and then Hong Kong. And I, we don't want to do it. But uh, the partner at Summit, Tom Jennings, he kept pushing. But guys, you know, it's, it's, it's a good thing. We, you'll see something different. We'll organize a few meetings. And uh, ultimately, we gave in and said, OK, we're, we're going to go. Apparently, Tom's not going to give up. So we went there, and Tom had lined up an amazing program from morning till late evening, meeting people, social stuff, mingling, and whatnot. And our first reaction was oh man, one, one week of grueling work in addition to, to the board meeting. But soon that, that changed drastically as we like, saw a lot of great and um, interesting people. Uh, the, the conversations were, were different. Just the, the whole atmosphere there is, is, is very different. And, and the question from what are we doing here transformed into why did, why did it take us 11 years since inception to find out that we have to be here? So we started uh, thinking about where we're going to set up an office, what kind of people we have to bring in on the team, what are we going to establish there, and um, it was, it was a, a, a great uh, journey, setting up the operation there, building uh, a network, hiring uh, really senior and uh, great people to lay the foundations of uh, some disciplines like uh, the, the CFO we, we attracted, um, the CMO we uh, managed to, to bring in the company. All those people really, really pushed us outside of our comfort zone and uh, made many, many things possible. And I'll be forever grateful on 
how much patience they had uh, for our stubbornness and uh, defensiveness on many, many things. But eventually all those things sunk in and uh, they, they're more or less today ingrained in us as like philosophy and things we, we want to do and that we've seen them bring to the, to the table that we want to replicate moving forward. Yeah, I really would like to know more about Silicon Valley. What uh, what people did you actually meet? Um, um, and uh, how, what is the set of them? What, uh, what you said that they are very different in how they they even talk. Uh, elaborate more on that. Uh, well, it, it it wouldn't surprise anyone in the audience. It's just the. Uh, the level of ambition that you find in different places. And it grows from east to west. You start from our region, ambition is small, numbers are small. You go to Zurich, London, ambition increases, numbers get bigger. You go to the east coast, it gets even bigger. You go to the West Coast, if it's not a billion dollar idea, nobody wants to, to talk about it, even on a napkin. So, it was, this, was, this was one of the really fascinating things, the, uh, the ambition of people. Now, who's capable of realizing that vision? And the vision is a different story, but just the, the permeating feeling is big, change the world. All of you are watching Silicon Valley, so you know you know the typical dialogues and uh, characters. Uh, but outside of that, the, the thing that really impressed me about Silicon Valley is um, one thing that you don't particularly find in in Europe, and that's how the network operates, how people are connected, how they help each other with referrals, with connections, with without you know the typical. Uh, approach of I do something quid pro quo. I do something for you, you do something for me immediately. There, I do something for you, you do something uh, good for somebody else, that somebody else maybe is something good for you because everything's really, really connected like a giant network. And that was, that was very different uh, for us and I found it very refreshing and it has really shaped my uh, philosophy and um, what I what I'd like us to to do here, uh, at least in Sofia, in, in in Bulgaria, in the in the region, that people embrace this behavior that they don't self-optimize, but rather they self-optimize by looking at what's the thing that all of us are trying to build, looking at the ecosystem, like having a more holistic and not so short-term. Uh, approach where you expect everything to pay off immediately for you. So those are the those are really the the, the two big uh, things that we, we found out as we were there. And the other thing is uh, the level of talent. Uh, is for some for some areas like user experience, product management, uh, product uh, marketing. Uh, enterprise sales, you really have very good schools of thought and the Valley attracts some of the world's best talent around it. So that was one of our motivations to open the Silicon Valley office, to, to build out the product management and product marketing uh, talent within the organization. And how being in the Silicon Valley influences the business? Is it it, 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 it paid off in, in, in big ways just because the nature of the people we brought in helped us change, uh, change a lot of things in, in, in the company. Uh, in terms of uh, everything that had to do with finances, the controls, the, the systems, the process, the governance, accountability, to our CMO coming in and forcing us more or less to rethink strategy, doing a rebranding, uh, repositioning the, the organization, uh, going uh, after the, the, the mobile market uh, and not really staying content uh, in, in, in the area where we had a lot of uh, success. And just the, the big thing was uh, 
internally, getting us out of our comfort zone, learning how to work with really senior uh, executives, becoming a lot more professional in everything, structuring the company in a different way, because that's one thing that wasn't apparently obvious for us as a problem. We were kind of uh, seeing the signs, but only when we brought in those senior people do you see what you were missing. So you have, you bring in a senior people that sits here, you, then they get 40, 50, 60 direct reports, no management structure, no process, no, no foundation to really scale the effort. And they were brought in to scale and we needed somebody to, to build out that infrastructure. So uh, at least we saw that the magnitude of the, of the challenge and we started addressing it with a lot more vigor than it would have otherwise happened. And uh, ultimately, it, it paid off for the company, J not just for all the people inside the company, but also from a market perspective. The company continued to grow, to outperform uh, its competitors in core markets. It was, it was all good. Painful, but good. Do you go to Silicon Valley? Not as much as I used to. I, I was there just a few weeks uh, ago. And it, it had been over a year since my last visit to, to the valley. These days I go mostly to, to uh, the East Coast because uh, both our biggest U.S. operation and uh, the corporate HQ, uh, biggest in terms of uh, the Excelatic side of things, and uh, the Progress uh, Software Corporate HQ are based in the Boston area. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned um, <coughs> that uh, you, do, you didn't have that much time for your family. How do you manage uh, your work-life balance now? It's difficult. I have a, I have a wife that, that tolerates me. That's the only reason why I can get away. In most families that wouldn't, that wouldn't go too well if you're missing in action for weeks on the road with two young kids. Um, she understands that oh, this is important for me, and she she's extremely supportive of uh, of everything I do. I, I wouldn't say I, I've got the the perfect balance. It's, it's it's important, and I'm working to to get closer to a balance. I have a question. How did you receive the proposal to sell the company, and there was a kind of for you and your uh, business partners to take this decision that you have. So, so good. the company that you have found. It's always a difficult decision. So, I mean, it's it's something which which you've seen grow from a baby to adolescence, if you will, if you make an uh, analogy with uh, human life. So, it, it, it was hard, but nonetheless, uh, gets back to my earlier point about that, that the emotions are not your best friend in, in this respect because you have a responsibility to a lot of other stakeholders and not just to yourself. And I mean, when you have 750 people, what's the best thing for them? What, what gives them the best career chances? What's best for your customers, for your investors? All of them have an agenda and for us that was the best way to solve uh, to solve for to optimize for the different agendas of the different uh, stakeholders and it was a great outcome it created a lot of opportunity for a lot of people uh, in terms of the mechanics it's nothing that uh, dramatic uh, as we started getting inbound offers we hired a banker because you don't know how that thing is done. You need to handle it professionally. Uh, and they more or less drove, drove the process. We drove what companies we really want to talk to, where we saw a synergy. With some there was a meeting of the minds, with others there wasn't. And uh, the, the, good, the good part for us that there was a meeting of the minds with, with Progress Software. We really liked uh, the people on the other side, we saw a fit on everything that we had identified as important for us, which was uh, that what 
what we built does not get dismantled, that things like Teleric Academy continue to live on, that it's a growth opportunity for everyone, for us, for our employees, that we don't do dramatic changes to our product portfolio, because if we were acquired by a company that had 70% overlap of product, that would have meant that we'd have to trim like half of the team on, on one side or another. So all those things were very important for us and that the party on the other end checked off well on them. So the other was mechanics, the typical stuff. Letter of intent, argue over terms, a little bit of drama, agree, handshake, kisses, love, and then the, the hard part of uh, integrating two companies and really making them one and being successful at that. And that's not an easy thing. The odds in general are, are not in your favor. Most of the um, of such transactions, they, they don't really create the, the expected result. And that's largely because people just don't care about what happens. And that, that's something with which I have a very big problem in the mindset of many uh, founders, people with whom I've spoken, whom uh, I've talked about this topic, who asked me, so why do you work uh, that hard, you, everybody else? Because it, it's your responsibility. When somebody trusts you, you have to do the right thing for the people who, who made an outcome for you. You, you owe it to, to them, but more so you owe it to yourself as a responsible human human being. You can't just bail out and go drink cocktails on uh, an island. There's a lot of work, it, it entails a lot of challenges, a lot of pains, but when you have belief that it's going to work out, when you have, when you work together to really define a vision, when you rally the people, make it all come together, then you have very good chances and I'm pretty sure we're going to be one of the 20%. One more question. Uh, you have said already success. Uh, can you summarize, let's say, three words or three activities that you had to do during this time in order to have this successful path and have a successful dream come true? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that definitely comes to mind is persistence. Mm -hmm. Success in anything, whether changing one of the habits that, that annoy you, building a company is, is not terribly easy. So you have to be persistent, you got to know that there's going to be pain, that there's going to be ups and downs, it's not linear, but if you're persistent, it gives you much better chances of success. The other thing is work hard. That might sound a look very obvious, but it's, it's, it's again about uh, the persistence things. You've got to persistently work hard. And the third one is uh, humility. Um, do know that you're going to make mistakes. Don't hate yourself for that. Don't hate others for that. Don't be too judgmental. Understand that this is part of growing up of, of, of life. Learn, embrace all, all of that, and you're going to find your way. So don't, probably there's other things, but those are the three that immediately came to mind. And what are the three uh, words that uh, support you to make uh, this merger of the two companies, this integration of the two companies? Commitment. You really you need to want to make it happen. The other one is patience. you got to be patient around that. And I keep telling people, look at yourself. It's, it's hard for you or me to change one habit, you know, change the way we do something. It's super hard. And you expect you know, a big group of people to start acting differently tomorrow and transform. It's, it's close to impossible. So learn. That, that, that's the, other, the third thing. Learn. Be open. Understand uh, like a good architect. Don't try to change architectures before you understand why it was built, built that way. Arm yourself with patience, see, explore, and then gently find a, a, a way to make it, uh, to make it better. And, and to meet these challenges, where do you get your inspiration? Where do you get your ideas, your motivation? Oh, th th this is probably the most, the, the, the toughest question. Uh, 
I don't know how you develop self-awareness. Much of the uh, of, of the things I've learned are just a combination of things: reading, looking at stuff, learning from nature. You know, putting one model that, that you see somewhere on top of something else, asking yourself uh, questions, listening to other uh, well-minded. Um, well-meaning people, people around you, and constantly working on that one, one small step at a time. I don't think there was like a, a one big epiphany where everything changed and you got reformed or inspired. It's small, small things. Learning to deal with yourself, learning how to manage your your uh, emotions, your states, learning how to motivate yourself, learning how to rely on on others. Becoming master of yourself and then of, of the, the other the big, world. The big challenge is always within you. Everything else is just a nuance. It's noise. So you don't you don't really understand that until a lot of fails. As your professional in uh, marketing and uh, business development, uh, can you tell us uh, how um, what was the marketing strategy in the beginning and how it changed during the years? Changed, changed a lot because we uh, we didn't stay uh, stay put with what made us successful in the early days. So, so we the nature of our competitors changed, the nature of our products changed, the nature of the market changed, and th there was no like playbook. Uh, the only thing that remained relatively consistent was the focus on customers and the customer experience stuff and the user experience and design side of things. Uh, those were like fundamental pillars of everything we were doing. Whether it was one technology or another, we tried to serve our customers really well because we believed and continue to believe that this is the best form of marketing, a satisfied customer. Give them a good product, make the whole experience of dealing with you uh, pleasurable, and everything else will take care of itself. And in terms of marketing, we've, we've done everything from the early days when we were embedding ourselves in conversations, um, uh, spurring conversations between ourselves so that you build community activity, you know, like schizophrenic talking to yourself in a forum. But uh, you got to be creative when you're a, a startup uh, in the middle of nowhere. And uh, we, we, once we had more funds, we started moving into the traditional side of things. Events, magazine, uh, advertisements, trade shows, uh, social, web advertising. Pretty much the, the, the whole mix that, that you, would, uh, you would see. Even internet radio and sponsoring podcasts and whatnot. So the, 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 the tools change, but and you gotta be you gotta embrace what's happening on, on, on the market because uh, media changed considerably in, in the years since we started. Before you had all those print publications. Today nobody does print, let alone advertise six pages in a print magazine. Uh, you have to learn how to do social advertising, social selling, events change, they're not what they used to be, the, the composition of events uh, changed, but one thing you just have to make sure is that you know who you are as a company and that you project a consistent image across all the marketing that, that, that you do, that you don't let, uh, let yourself go into a point where in different channels you talk different things and people don't know who you are and you're inconsistent. That the, just the importance of brand in our social connected world change. So these days you got to be a lot more focused on your brand rather than on just the product as we were in the early days where product took care of itself. Today you have a lot of choice in pretty much everything. So the brand, the experience, the consistency of the messages really uh, is paramount to success. And how do you identify opportunities for business development now? It's 
still a little bit of a voodoo magic, you know. So, and and I don't think there's like a great playbook on how to be successful, but there's plenty of playbooks how to minimize the amount of stupid things you can do. And our focus is more on minimizing the stupid things we can do, and still not trying to. Um, build like a model where we just plug in something in an Excel file and it spits out the success formula. Because I, I don't believe this this uh, this can be the case. Uh, but typically, when when we want to do something, we we explore different options. So where can growth come in? We look at the different revenue streams. Can it come from old customers? Should it be from new customers? Uh, what markets are we strong in? What are adjacent markets? Where's the opportunity? What are the big industry waves in those markets? What are the segments within those markets? What What's the problem that people are facing? A clear definition of who are those people because you know there is no such thing as a, a company. It's an abstraction. So. What are the personas? What are the relationships? And what are their pain points? Then, what are we gonna do to help them solve those pain points? What's the business model? What's the go-to-market strategy? Yada, 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 and then all the execution. The, the most of the time, the, the problem is really in all of it coming together, not so much the original idea. The original idea many times changes, but. Connecting the dots between all the functions, uh, connecting the dots between the problem, the value proposition, the business model, the go-to-market strategy, and the execution of that is really where, where things break. Because if it, it's like a giant ship. If it's a ship, you can easily steer it in, in a different direction. But if it's like a lot of fragments floating around, you can't, you can't meaningfully course correct. You mentioned uh, Telluric Academy. How? Why did you um, come come up with the idea for Telluric Academy? Was it for marketing purposes at first, or? Uh, if you start with marketing purposes before you know solving something legitimate and real, you, you don't end up with with a lot of success. And the academy was built out of a real need. Because we needed to, to grow really fast. We were adding about 100 people a year. So back then, that was the size of a mid sized technology company in, in, in Bulgaria. So obviously, we couldn't uh, easily add another company. And uh, the other thing was that we saw that you don't have much of, uh, of an experienced talent pool. All the experienced people were content with where they were, with few exceptions. So you couldn't find 100 uh, experienced people per year. And we had to rethink our model on how we operate and how to make the best use of the senior people we have in the company, but also complement them with the very capable uh, young, young people who would join the ranks of the company and who would then grow into uh, leaders and uh, strong professionals that would groom the next generations in the company. So, uh, really small, actually the, the first um, attempt at the academy was with um, Svet Lunakov. Uh, he was working for another company and we tried to do uh, a training which was for only seven people. We sponsored two of the guys, um, but we saw that this thing can't solve our problem. Two to a hundred was a 50 time difference of, of what we needed. So we sat down and identified ways in which we can make that work at scale. And uh, one of the things that became apparent is that we would never be successful if we didn't offer this as free education because people wouldn't, wouldn't pay uh, just because of the nature of who we had to attract those guys didn't have a job, uh, it was their path to get a better job and to be more qualified 
And so that's how it was born. And uh, iteration after iteration, it grew in size up until today's size, where the badges uh, for software engineering, for quality assurance, uh, we get uh, six, seven hundred people in, in attendance for each of the seasons. And in addition to that, you have all kinds of uh, curriculum, curriculum from two, three day uh, technology. Uh, seminars or tracks to a little bit longer to something that uh, we, we just introduced uh, with, together with Google which is the, the marketing academy so our uh, it's an interesting model because it tries to map out what we're seeing in internally what we're seeing in the market and build that into curriculum against those competencies required by the by the market and we've got pretty good at it and what I find really re rewarding is how many other initiatives that follow the same model have, uh, have emerged and everybody has found their place under the sun and all of them are amazing because they, they help solve the biggest problem which is shortage of talent and there's place for everybody to train, retrain and really help all those people young and not so young uh, be successful uh, with their technology career aspirations. I have a question regarding the Bulgarian startup system. Uh, what do you think um, um, is is the reason why we don't have um, more companies like like uh, Telerik, for example? What what do Bulgarian entrepreneurs lack in terms of skills, knowledge? Connections, maybe. I think one of the things we lack is patience. And I'm pretty sure that there will be companies as successful and even more successful than Telerik. But it's, it's, a, it's a function of time. You, if you look at any ecosystem around the world, you didn't get like a ton of companies appearing on, on day one. There was one group of people one company around which something happened then something bigger happened because I remember the people who inspired me I remember uh, the NetAge guys who inspired me about building a kick-ass company that did some of the most amazing design work uh, web design work that uh, was one of the first uh, product companies selling software to alternative uh, financial institutions Oh, that was big. That, that, that inspired me. Our success is bigger than theirs, but that was the inspiration I needed to know that something good can happen here. Hopefully, many young people will, will get that spark from us and they'll build something bigger. But it's a, it's a matter of time and all of us need to support those ideas, build out the good practices, establish the right like uh, way to, to collaborate, build the right level of... Um, expectations in, in everyone and with, with enough iterations, hard work and persistence you see plenty of successes. I'm a, I'm a big believer. I've actually, I actually have a bet with Lugu that in uh, five to ten years we'll have a company that's worth a billion dollars coming from, from here. I actually, I put, yeah, I put it on each. There's a big pool of money, my, my, my pension fund. <laughs> <laughs> what, what means coming from here? Okay, it's in Sofia. Yeah, Sofia, Bulgaria. I have a question. Um, can you name alternative types of, uh, let's say, startup financing, except, for example, angel investors or accelerator funds? Something from your experience that you have tried to do, even if it's failed or can work for this ecosystem here? Yeah, well, in our case, the, the only thing close to financing was uh, the, the generous offer from our parents to give us 5,000 bucks each. Uh, and we politely said no because uh, it wouldn't have worked out well. Uh, I actually think there's enough capital here, contrary to the belief of some, some people. There is enough capital, uh, and if you have a good idea, you can 
find ways to finance it. And I don't know why would why you would look at uh, some alternative instrument if you have enough angel investors who can put money in you, if you have acceleration uh, and seed funds, uh, if you have all the other things like Kickstarter and crowdsourcing tools to make it happen. And let's say you have a little bit of funding. It's not that difficult to, you don't need that much capital to start a company, at least for most of the types of companies that, that, that people start. I mean, it's, very few from what I've seen are really capital intensive uh, companies where you need to, to have a very strong, tight plan on how you're going to raise capital, a lot of capital from zero to millions of series A, B, C in a matter of a uh, uh, very short time frame. So for me, may, maybe if you give a little bit more context uh, for, for the question, I'll, I'll be able to, to better answer it. It's not about the initial investment, you could say, the parents uh, mm -hmm. help, but it's more for growing your business from the point where it is right now. I mean, you have this base, for example, you have covered Bulgaria, you're operating here, and then you want to move outside Bulgaria, let's say, cover Europe, for example. How, instead of going to an angel, I'm just asking about the alternatives, I'm not saying that angels or accelerators are bad. That's why if you have Based on your experience, or somebody, some of your friends? My, my experience is you, you typically have two options. Get sell equity or get debt. And for most of the startups, nobody wants to give you debt because as a technology company, you, you have nothing on the other end to as collateral. So more or less, you're, you're only in your better chances to, to get to, to give out equity in order to build something more meaningful. And the, the good part of an investor is that they it's not dumb capital. So you bring in somebody else on the table who participates in the growth of the company and has a vested interest in the bank. The bank, if it's collateralized, they couldn't care less about how you're gonna manage to you know work out the the loan. They're not your business partner, whereas uh, an investor, whether it's an angel investor or a VC fund or a private equity firm, depending on where you are in the spectrum, is always somebody who has a very strong vested interest in your success. Some are better than others. And that, that's your responsibility to pick the right partner, whom you have the chemistry, or you've done your research on who can help you the most with their network, with their expertise in a given field with their uh, with the level of talent they can attract, with the terms they'll give you. More but one, one, of the, one of the things uh, that I, I've seen is a lot of people get too hung up on valuation, uh, this number, that number. In reality, it's all irrelevant. You either build a big company or you don't. And we've had many of, of those discussions throughout the years and always we, we optimized for building a big company rather than the, the, the teeny weeny details uh, at, at each of the steps. So we self-optimized for the long term and getting smart money helps, helps with that. I have a question too. Uh, at the beginning, with no background, how exactly did you make uh, your first contacts with clients, partners? We didn't have any partners and people just came to our website. So the way Google works is it indexed our content, it indexed where we showed up on other external websites. So people started coming in. Obviously our value proposition was good enough. The pricing licensing technology worked out and customers transacted. Just website, mm -hmm. emails, yeah. phone calls. Nothing we didn't we didn't have I mean we we had never sold tools, we had never built tools, we had never operated on international markets, we never ran a business so we, we didn't have the, the network. Now if I start a business I'm gonna start it from a different, you know, base. But back then, we didn't have any of that. 
and we didn't have any angel investors and smart people to really help us avoid some of the mistakes we've done. I have a question as well. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, about the hiring uh, people. What is your clue that you need to grow from four people to, to 100 people a year to, to bring more people to company? And how do you evaluate what kind of professional you need and how much of these talents you need? And, and what is the process of, of hiring those people? So, the, uh, I'll give you a different answer. Sir, if I may build up on that question mm -hmm. as well. Um, you have been named uh, to be the most desirable like uh, employer in Bulgaria mm -hmm. a couple of times. And uh, when does that start exactly, just to, to build on that? Like, when do you form the culture and when do you decide that this is the form that is going to work? So the culture you, you form with day one. But so for people, there's still culture there? Uh, there's a culture all the time. Because culture is the common denominator of how people think and how they act. And uh, whether it's four or four hundred, there's a set of behaviors and set of thinking which govern how everything works with, outside of the written, written rules. Culture is not something that you design by committee, you say, you, you create all those beautiful words. It's essentially the behaviors of an organization. And the organization can be two people, can be 200. So from day one, when you start a company, when you leave a team, you set the culture, implicitly or explicitly. And uh, if, if it happened, it didn't happen because we set out to create a given culture. We didn't, we didn't have experience. We just, when we started the company, we just knew what we would like to avoid because we had experience of what we didn't like. And it, when, when, when your leadership, uh, whether it's on a team level or on a company level, uh, works hard, emanates uh, positivity in, in many ways, uh, leads people, it's, it's, it's contagious. And that helped. That, that's the reason why people referred other people to, to come join in the company. They believed in what we were doing, they felt it, it matters, they saw the, the results of, 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 uh, their, of their work. Uh, it, it was very open environment where we didn't have uh, much of a hierarchy but in the early days. Free, uh, free form communication, everybody's accessible. We were a product company, so that was different. And this, this helped us uh, attract uh, all, all, all those good guys. And many of the early uh, employees, there were not employees that we hired you know, from job ads. It was uh, friends, friends of friends, people who, who believed in what we were doing, who recommended uh, good, good people, and, and they joined. In terms of uh, Scaling that effort, uh, the best thing is advice. We didn't do it that way. We we're, were just hired and hired and hired and hired as much as we could afford for many, for many years. Uh, but today, when when I'm thinking about hiring, I'm you know trying to look at, try to have a much better understanding of how everything works. I look at it from a more uh, like production line that like who does what, what are the handoffs, and in order to deliver this much of whatever, how much do we need the input, what's the velocity, what's the, who's responsible for what, and based on that, when you see a gap and you say, I want to do 2x of this, well, you need some people here, you need some investments here, that drives more or less who, who you need, what skills they need, and what what are going to be their goals and requirements. Before that, we, we, did, we weren't too disciplined uh, about it. And it's, always, and it's always good to go through that because when the person comes in, they know why, why they're there, they know how they'll be measured, judged, developed, and ultimately whether they were successful or not. It's, it makes it much easier for you to avoid the, the type of management that 
I and others practice uh, just a function of, of growth and knowledge. Love them till you hate them. And this is uh, very, very prevalent in pretty much any company. That because you didn't think too hard about why you need that person, what are they going to do, how are they going to be measured, not just your opinion, I like that guy, I don't like them tomorrow because something happened. It's a much healthier dynamic for the relationship um, between everyone. So when did you actually come up with a strategy of hiring? Like at what point in the development of the company? When, when we started, get, uh, when we became a bigger organization and we saw the need to really standardize many other things, clean up uh, the mess, have process, have uh, all, all those things that uh, a more mature company needs when we set up the human capital team. That was basically the, so the beginning. So when were you a mature company, to your mind? I, I'm never content, so I'd say that even today we're not as mature as I'd like us to be. It's just a, a continuum. But today we're much more professional and organized uh, than, than we were a year ago two years ago, three years ago, so that, that, that's the only thing I care about. I don't know where where's the limit to that. I just want to see that tomorrow we're better off than we were yesterday, even if it's like a small improvement. To the extent that uh, your current role allows you, uh, could you please share more about how um, how the acquisition played out for the employees or how, how it uh, did some people leave? Uh, how was was there a big difference between the process of the companies? Uh, this whole process isn't very common for a Bulgarian company to go through. So it would be very yeah. So starting with the culture, there there definitely were um, differences because you have uh, an age difference. Uh, there's like a, 10 plus year difference in the average age of the two companies prior to the to the to the acquisition. So uh, then you have uh, those companies having a different center of gravity where they were born, what they did. But what what really mattered is not so much the cultures, and I've said this before. Uh, culture is something that changes, but what shouldn't change is values. Uh, Culture changes with size, with uh, international expansion, with strategy. But if your values change, then you have a problem. And there was a, a, a lot of overlap in terms of core values. Both companies valued people, um, were uh, very technology centric, proud, you know, to, to create quality uh, technology. Uh, People were easy, easy to, to work with and, and get along. Uh, weren't uh, were hierarchical, but still you could pass through those things. And you know, it, in terms of, of values, things things worked out. So the fact that culture was not identical was more of a good thing because today it allows us to bring out the best of uh, uh, the two former companies to really create a new one, which. Uh, is going to be different and, and more capable and, and uh, successful. Um, so that that's the, the, the stuff about culture. And what was the other? Uh, well, the, the transition. How did it impact the? Uh, yeah. Team? Uh, well, obviously, you in, in any such case, you have people uh, leaving. Some people don't uh, want to be inside a big organization. They, they have just built a mental model that you can't be an entrepreneur within a big organization and that it's just not for you. Uh, you, you can't you know, uh, judge, judge people. Uh, ultimately, the only thing that matters is how people leave uh, a, a company because there's proper ways to do it and not so great ways. To, to do it, and we've had uh, examples of, of both. My my hope is that down the road you have people understand that they always need to leave a company in good terms, build a succession plan, so that they enable their colleagues uh, to be to be successful. Uh, that they don't leave a big hole because somebody else has to fix it. 
just when you, when you do those things and when you're sensitive about what you're leaving behind, the fact that you left the company just creates more opportunity for you, for everyone else in the company, and because you played out everything well till your very end and you were positive and you did good things for the company, then you have a potential customer, a potential partner, a potential acquirer, and this amplifies the, the ecosystem impact. Whereas if you do it the other way around, you destroy a lot of value for you, for the company, for the, the people around you, many of whom were, were the people who created the success for you so that you can grow up in this company and ultimately when an acquisition came that you know you managed to cash all those healthy, uh, healthy cash out uh, all those options that you had. And in that respect, uh, that's something that I'm really proud of. Uh, for how many people the, the acquisition had a, an impact. Uh, it's not a fairly wide known fact, but over 300 people in the company had uh, stock options. Pretty, pretty wide uh, pool. Has, has a, now that Progress is a, Progress is a public company, uh, has some of this, has some of the dynamics changed to the team? Yeah, like you said earlier, that you didn't want to be the one running it, but... Yeah. The one thing that changed, uh, and, and I was pretty surprised uh, that uh, gets back to the previous question, is that um, we had lower turnover for 2015, which was the year of the uh, acquisition and the integration than in the former two years when we were doing all the uh, big changes and really uh, rethinking a lot of things and reshuffling things in the company. So this, this to me is a good testament that things played out well and that people are seeing enough opportunity to stick around. But again, it's, it's normal for people to, to move. I'm not a big believer in the Japanese model where you join a company and you work there for 60 years for, for life. But the, the, the thing that I, I appeal to all of you, whether you're running your own business or working for somebody else, is just to think about the impact of you not being around and what are the prerequisites for your team, your company, your startup to be successful if you're not around tomorrow for whatever reasons because that's going to build a better outcome for you and for everyone else around you. And if I may ask this question, where along the way did you already know that uh, you're going uh, to opt for an exit to the company? In terms of? In, in, to sell the company because you decided you, ha uh, you have responsibility or not only the founder, but you're the CEO and so on. But I am sure that probably, you can tell me, in the beginning you had this in mind. You had something else in mind when you were building a company. Mm. Or, or, or did you have this no, idea in we, mind? we never had uh, any concrete ideas about how we're going to exit. We just knew it, it has to happen. But if, if that's something I changed... From the beginning, on. From the beginning, we didn't have any ideas about exiting a company. Our only idea was how to survive. So it was pretty, pretty simple. Uh, you start thinking about exits and whatnot when uh, you start thinking about raising capital, what that really means for you as a, as a company. Are you going to build a professional business or a lifestyle business? Because those are very different. They drive different uh, behavior. And once we uh, got the investment from, from Summit, we knew that we, we have to exit in a number of years, in one of the three ways. Okay. So we didn't know when, we didn't know who that would be, but we knew we, it, it would happen some someday. Uh, and one thing that I would have done differently and I would advocate to all of the people running startups is to think about their exit options as early on as possible because when you map out who is the potential acquirer for your company then you would see as an interim step who's, my, who's the best partner for me how do I create value for them for their ecosystem and it's going to give you a lot of insights about what you need to do to position yourselves properly for that to happen
because you know things things are not accidental. If nobody knows about you. Nobody's gonna want to buy. Do you know people that uh, look so long term in perspective? There are some people. There are people I know who are extremely good at building a company and knowing how it's gonna exit. I personally don't think I. I've come anywhere close to knowing how things will pan out and moreover I see so much uh, s such a dynamic uh, change in the technology space that I think it's pretty hard to predict what's going to happen in four or five years so how even if I were starting a new company I wouldn't s start thinking from the offset about an exit and building a company for the exit uh, actually it's a fine line I would think about how the exit would be, but I wouldn't build a company just to sell it to XYZ, company XYZ. So from an investor standpoint, uh, a company with an exit strategy from day one? Oh, the bad thing is when people are focused about the exit, but not building sustainable businesses, uh, as Paul already said. So start building, so how, how it played out for them was they need to survive, they need to get as much revenue as possible. So from that perspective, they started thinking how to sustain that growth. And in between, they started thinking about the exit. So, so that's, this is that's strategy actually, is kind of a dream that you might have or not? Start building a sustainable business, start thinking how to build a sustainable business, and down the road, try to identify the exit opportunities mm. and start building on, on that relationship. Your primary responsibility should be to, to build a business, not to sell a business. One more question concerning the beginning. How was it at the beginning? Uh, was it a goal? Was it an idea? Or it was a dream? And one second question. During this time, were there any people that tried to steal some of the business? Or are there any borders? Because I mean, this is still Bulgaria? No. It's still Bulgaria, but you know, this thing with the stealing of the businesses, I have a different opinion. Generally, people don't steal a legitimate business. <laughs> <laughs> they steal something that was stolen. Yeah. And the, the problem with, with technology is that it relies on people. So it's a little bit harder to to make people do something if they don't want to do it. Lots of free will involved. <laughs> and uh, in the early days, it, it, it was the same thing. It just the, the environment was more, more harsh. Because much of the infrastructure on which you can rely today was non-existent. And in terms of dream, I actually, as far as I can remember, because it's a little bit blurred nowadays, we didn't have much of a big dream. We just wanted to create something that would pay the bills, survive. Uh, you're, when, you, when you have to deal with survival, it's, it's not that glorious. And I can tell you all kinds of pretty stories now, and how the big vision, and how you know, we whiteboarded it and had a vision 10 years down the road. But it's not the case. We didn't have an idea. We didn't have far-reaching goals. We just wanted to survive in the next six, seven, eight months. And, and we kind of liked we kind of liked working with each other, despite some of the friction. <laughs> and what are your dreams now? See a unicorn, and not, not one unicorn, because as I joke, we. We just uh, managed to build one quarter of a unicorn, so somebody now has to uh, focus on the other three legs <laughs> and uh, build, really, really see more good companies uh, come out of here and see uh, not just big and successful companies, but also responsible companies who would continue giving. Because uh, I'm a big believer that if you have just a focus on profits, it doesn't end well for, for, for the society and, and the community. If you're focused just on ethics, then it's not sustainable because you need money to sustain the good, the good things. So I really hope that 
there's more companies who believe in profit uh, in profits on the right ethics where you go for profit but you do that in a way which is sustainable and you understand that you're part of something bigger and that it's your responsibility being successful to give capital knowledge as a, as a, as a human being and as a company you, that it's your responsibility if you're well off to give and not to give in a dumb way so that you feel that uh, you look better in the eyes of the man above but that you really do something meaningful to help other people be, be prepared to do the same for, for, for others and future generations. So if this happens, I'll be one very happy person. And, and for that, you need to do some of the things I'm doing today. Work hard, learn new things so that I can share with you, you can share with others, and all of us collectively can build something amazing. And it goes to, to you know how I see things working out. If our sector w works out well, if there's a lot of great companies creating a lot of value that drags other sectors, other people, and one by one you change things for, for the better, rather than the approach of you, know, you wave the magic wand and something from top-down perspective changes miraculously. So, for me, this is an investment in my kids and in your kids and really leaving something good for them and the reason to stay in, in, in Bulgaria. That, that's another thing I hope to see. More people not just not going, but people coming in here because they see opportunity, because they see uh, a chance to do something meaningful with their lives. So to conclude, uh, you recommend to the businesses to go to Silicon Valley as soon as possible? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I, I recommend going to all places where you can learn, where you can grow, but not forgetting your roots, where you come from, and making sure that you pay back. Because all of those people, your parents, your grandparents, the people in the neighborhood, they've invested in you. And when you go to the valley, it's because people invested in you. Regardless of whether you think that you're the superstar that made it despite everything because of you know your superhero abilities. And the uh, last thing uh, that you recommend uh, to all of us as a... Um... Be positive. That, that's the, the, one, the one thing I'd recommend. Uh, focus on the things you can control, stay positive about them, disregard the small bumps, it's just a small stone on a very big journey. And if you get obsessed about the small stone that got uh, in between your foot and your sandal, you can complain a lot, but in the grand scheme of things, just dust off, look at where you're going, enjoy it, and don't, don't deal with, with the marginal stuff. As I like to quote a friend of mine, he said something that, that influenced me quite a bit. Invest in the things you want to grow bigger. If you want to invest in your uh, antagonism with a given person in, in a problem, keep on whining about it, keep on complaining, keep on you know being unhappy with something. Alternatively, just do something about it. Be positive and move on. Thank you very much.